Good morning, and welcome to Studio Time with Deb, the online version. Today, what we're going to do is, last week I talked to you about cleaning up solder messes, and one of the things that I said is, don't make a mess in the first place. But I didn't tell you how not to make a mess in the first place. And I had several emails about, how do I do that? How do I not make a mess in the first place? So today, what I'm going to talk to you about is some ways to not make a mess in the first place. So hopefully you won't even need last week's class because this will all be better. Okay. So the very first trick, the very first thing is that before you solder anything, what you need to do is to clean the pieces thoroughly. And I don't mean clean them like get the dirt off. I mean clean them like get the scratches out. I'm not nearly as worried about the dirt. Honestly, when you solder, you can solder with a little bit of dirt on things. I mean, I, I, we lie to you when you're beginners. Um, they don't have to be pristine. Your finger oil does not make any difference. Um, but what does make a difference is if you've got scratches in there, if your surface is not really, really what you want it to be, to clean that up later is a big deal. It's a very big deal. And you'll spend a lot of time cleaning it up. It's much easier to do when the pieces are separated. So the number one trick is to make sure that your piece is free of scratches. Make sure that it's got the finish that you want. Make sure that that's in, it's in good shape. So number two is that I'm not to use too much solder. Don't use too much solder. But what I want to do before I tell you more tricks is I want to back up a little bit and I want to remind you because most of you are intermediate advanced students and you haven't heard the beginning solder lecture in a long time. So what I want to do, I'm not going to do the whole lecture, but I'm going to give you a key point. And one of the key points of soldering, jeweler silver soldering, is that both pieces, both of the pieces we're trying to join must be to the flow point of the solder at the same time in order for them to join. And that is critical. And when you understand that, you can control the heat a lot. You can control where the heat goes. You can control what's happening with the pieces. And I'm gonna show you a slideshow later that has some, um, some different situations in it. And I'm gonna to talk to you about heat and where you put the heat and how that works. But that is absolutely critical for figuring out how to not make a mess, is to really understand the heat and to understand, and I'm gonna say this over and over today, that both pieces have to be to the flow point of the solder at the same time, okay? In order for that joint to work and work well. So what determines if solder flows and where it flows? Number one is heat. That is absolutely the number one thing. That is above dirt, that is above um, gravity, that is above just about anything is heat. Number two though is capillary action. And what that means is that the solder is going to tend to flow and want to flow where pieces are touching each other. And we can use that to our advantage, and especially if we have control of the heat. So capillary action is a really important part of what we're talking about with all this and how we prevent making a mess. So again, number one, don't use too much solder. I'd rather use solder three or four times and not enough solder than to solder once with too much. You solder once with too much, you absolutely have to clean up your mess. Um, so if you can just minimize the solder, that's good. Now you can pull it through a draw plate and make it small. I know that um, um, what was it? Fire Mountain is selling 24 gauge wire solder. And I think Rio has thinner wire solder now. And you pay a premium for it being thinner. If you have a draw plate, you can draw it through yourself. Um, but the thinner solder will help you cut it into tinier pieces. You can also take your wire solder, roll it through the rolling mill, flatten it, and then cut it into little pieces. Um, so that you cut the, you cut the strip long ways and then cut, cut off little chunks, cut off little pallions. You can also buy a uh, chip solder because each one millimeter chip is just a tiny, tiny bit of solder. So if you're doing something that's really delicate, that's a good way to go to not use too much solder. Number two thing that you can do that's really important is that you can pre-flow solder into a defined area. So usually what we do, not always, but usually you'll flow solder onto the smaller of two pieces being joined. And the reason we use the smaller piece 
is because if you flow it on the larger piece, it can go all over the place. You put the small piece on and then you've still got solder all over the place, right? But if you put it on the small piece and you put it down, then it pretty much is just under the small piece. So then you've got it. So that's why we usually do the smaller piece. I'm gonna show you some samples today where we don't do the smaller piece and I'll explain why. Um, but it allows, so one of the things that happens when you pre-flow the solder on the small piece is that it allows you to clean up that piece ahead of time. So in other words, if I have two pieces of metal, a small piece and a large piece I'm trying to join together, and I pre-flow the solder on the small one, but let's say it goes down the side and, and makes a mess. I haven't joined those pieces together yet. There's no reason that I can't take that small piece, take it back to my bench, I know, I know, it's okay, take it back to my bench, clean it up, clean off the extra solder so that I just have solder where they're going to touch. I don't want solder anywhere else. I only want it where they're going to touch. I'll clean off all the excess solder and then I'll proceed with the solder joint. And then I only have solder where I really want it, where I really want it to flow. So it allows me to clean that up without doing damage to the other pieces or to the small one. I can get to it a lot easier and it's a lot faster than trying to do it after they're joined together. Pre-flowing the solder also does another thing. What it does is that every time the solder flows, and I know you guys have heard this before, but every time the solder flows, it burns off a little bit of the trace metals and it raises the flow point by about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. What that buys me is that that makes that solder joint a little bit higher temp than the equivalent other solder joints. So in other words, if this is my first solder joint and I am putting it together. Oh, let's say it's not my first. Let's say I've built a bezel, okay? And I used all hard solder on my bezel and I wanna solder my bezel to something. And if I solder my bezel to something using medium solder, but I use the pre-flow method, then I've got medium plus 25 degrees. So then if I wanna add something else to it, I can still use medium with a little bit of extra confidence, a little bit of extra cushion there because the one where I attached it to whatever is medium plus 25 degrees. So it buys me a little bit of extra temperature. Um, and you can really use that to your advantage. It's not a lot, it, but it does buy you something. Do I have a question about that? Yeah. What is the temperature step between hard and medium and between medium and easy? Is that 25, like 50% of the way or what? No, it's... Uh, I would have to look it up to be sure, but it's about 100 degrees, I would say, maybe more, 100 to 150. Okay. So it's buying you part of that, but not a significant portion. Well, noticeable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next thing is to fix your piece. So if you can hold your piece in place, one of the things that happens is um, sometimes when we're soldering, pieces move, they shift, they float on the flux, they move around, you have to slime them back into place. And um, so if we can do something to fix the pieces, to hold them in place a little bit better and a little bit steadier, then that's going to really help us not make solder messes because it's going to be stable, right? And I'm gonna show you some methods for that. But some of the things we can use, we can use cotter pins, we can use third hands, we can use a tripod. We can use titanium clamps. We can use solder clay, T-pins. I'm not gonna show you all of those today. I'm gonna show you a couple things. Um, but I have some to show you that I think will be really interesting for you. And then the last thing to think about is to heat sink the smaller or the more fragile part. And what I mean by that is if I have a piece that has a lot of cutouts in it, so that basically it's just like a skeleton. It's just got these, these little pieces of metal connecting everything. If I take a torch to that, I'm guaranteed I'm gonna melt it. I'm gonna flow solder all over it because it's gonna heat up faster than anything else. So what I wanna do is to put it in a position where it's not going to heat up so much. So I will put it face down. I will be sure that it's face down on my fire brick and that I have a clean fire brick. That fire brick will help protect that metal a little bit. So I can do the same thing if I have, say, a bezel. If I put the bezel upside down on a fire brick or if I bury it into a Kaiser Lee board, that's going to help protect that bezel. But I can still get heat into it from the back. So I can still heat it up, but it's a little bit protected so that 
um, I don't have to worry as much about the solder flowing all over it. I can control that heat a little bit better. Tweezers, self-locking tweezers, like if I'm soldering a jump ring to something, if I hold self-locking tweezers over half the jump ring, then what's going to happen is that jump ring is not going to be as quick to heat up. So the solder isn't going to flow all over the jump ring because I have to heat the tweezers and the jump ring up to the flow point of the solder. Uh, you can use a brass sheet to cover parts to more equalize the heat. Uh, you can heat only the large piece so that if I'm putting, say, a ring shank on the back of a bezel, um, and say it's a, a little bezel, a, a you know, relatively small bezel, what I can do is to turn that bezel upside down on the fire brick, put the ring shank on it. Sometimes I can't even see the bezel. So let's say the bezel's so little that I can't see it at all. If I just heat that ring shank up really well, silver conducts heat so well that it's going to go into that bezel. It's going to heat from the ring shank into the bezel. And the solder, if it's already flowed on the back of the bezel, won't flow until that bezel is hot enough until it's up to the flow point of the solder. And once it is, it's to the flow point of the solder because the ring shank is to the flow point of the solder. So both of them will flow. It'll flow on both of them, just the way I want it to, okay? So sometimes it's by the way I set it up. It's what I set up and how I organize that, that, that the heat, I'm gonna make the heat equal on both parts. All right, I've got a slideshow to show you. I've got, I took a whole bunch of slides of different situations and we're gonna talk about those and how, how to heat those and how to minimize any solder mess up. Do I have any questions before I start the slideshow? I do, Deb, this is Carla. Hi, Carla. Hey, um, what do you think about uh, balling up the solder before you put it down? I know a lot of people say you should do that, but I haven't. Um, so if I'm pick soldering, I, I will always do that, right? And balling right. up the solder buys you, again, that 25 degrees because you flowed the solder already. So it gets you a little bit higher temperature. Um, as far as balling it up for any other reason, the only other reason that I would do it is if that's the only way I could get it to fit somewhere. So in other words, having a pallion or, or having a, 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 a little um, clip of solder or whatever that I couldn't get it to stay in place, so I would do a ball. Uh, but that's rare. That's very, very rare. Um, other than other than pick soldering, I don't see a good reason to ball it up ahead of time, um, unless you want to buy yourself that 25 degrees. Maybe there's a reason that you want to do that. And the other thing is, so each time it's actually a little bit less, but if you want to, what you can do is you ball up the solder, bought you 25 degrees, and then you flow it again. That buys you another, say, 20 degrees. Right. Roughly. Okay. Oh, so it might, okay. Thanks. Yeah, it might do that. And so depending on what your situation is, that could be beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. But that's the only reason I can think of for doing it. And again, pick soldering, pick soldering. It'd be a great, I mean, then you need to do that. Anything else? So Deb, right. you, you mentioned that it increases by 20 some degrees each time. About, I mean, that's a, it's roughly, yeah. Is there a top end? Oh, sure. I mean, so what you're doing when you do that is that you burn off a little bit of the trace metals that are in there, a little bit of the alloy material, and each time it's a little bit less. So, I mean, once you, you're not ever going to burn it all off, right? Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there is. I don't know what it is. I, that'd be a James Binion question if he, you know, he, he's the metallurgist. He knows these things. Um, I know that you can do it a couple of times. I mean, typically we don't reflow our solder more than two or three times. So I don't think we raise it that much in that process. Does that make sense? Is that good? It yeah. does. And one other question. You've told us that if we have soldered something and brought up the fine silver, silver in an area that we need to clean off the fine silver? Yes, absolutely. Because if you've got fine silver on the surface from, from, from previous um, either annealing or from um, other solder joints, you know, when you've put it in the pickle, you are soldering to that fine silver layer. 
And that fine silver, when you solder to the fine silver layer, that is not a strong solder joint. That's likely to come apart. So what you need to do is any place that you want a good solder joint, you do need to sand down or get down to that silver layer where you're down to the sterling or whatever your base metal is. Okay. And don't solder to the fine silver. So what if we put too little solder, for example, under a bezel? and it only solders part way, do we just disregard that rule of trying to clean out the fine silver before yes. we Yep, yep. And the other thing is you gotta think about the strength of the joint. So if I'm putting on say an earring back, an earring post on something and on an earring and, um, and I've got fine silver on that earring already, and I solder the post on, I have a tiny, tiny, tiny joint. And so that's gonna be a really weak joint. But if I'm doing something that's a sweat joint, say I've got a bezel that's got a whole back on it and I'm soldering that back onto something, that's a huge solder joint. And so even if I'm soldering onto fine silver, it's gonna be okay. It's, it's not gonna lift up that much. It's just gonna, you know, it might not be as strong as if I was down to base metal, but it's plenty strong to, to last for, it, it's not going to come apart. So I need to be, I need to think about what kind of solder joint I'm doing and what it looks like. If I'm doing a butt joint and both of those ends are coated in fine silver and it's a ring, chances are it's going to break over time. It's going to break there um, because that butt joint is just those two edges. But if I do an overlap joint and it's fine silver, it's probably not going to matter. Along that line, Deb, if you are doing a butt joint or like two pieces going together and you, you flow the solder and it doesn't go all the way to the end, but you don't notice it till after you've cleaned it up, is, your, is what you do to re-put more solder on there and try that again? I would not put more solder on at least once. I would flux it. Now, when you've already done a solder joint like that, so I've got my two pieces of metal here, right? And say the solder only went part way, right? Yeah, right. And what I would do is you need to flux the front side and the back side because fluxing the front side mm. only, the flux doesn't go through because you've already got solder there, right? Uh-huh. So you flux the front side and the back side, and then you need to heat. And with heat, you can reflow that solder and try to draw it on down into the rest of the solder joint. And if, if, if it didn't solder because you don't have enough solder, then the next time you might have to add some. But if it didn't solder only because it either wasn't hot or it got dirty during the process or whatever, you can complete that solder joint without adding more solder. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question, Deb. Yeah, Kathy. Kathy, um, <clears throat> if uh, fine silver creates a barrier situation when you're soldering, is there a parallel problem when you're using, when you're soldering base metals like nickel, brass, copper? Does, oh, is I would, it, yeah, I, mean, I would think so, yeah. So uh, copper, no, copper is, is a, a pure metal, right? It's like fine silver. If you're soldering to fine silver or copper, they're pure metals, so you don't have a, a layering effect. Right. If you're doing red brass or nickel or something that is an alloy, you know, uh, with red brass, that it, when you put it in pickle, you get that copper layer on it. Mm -hmm. And if you solder to that copper layer, then you've got the same issue. Yeah. And okay. I wouldn't call it a barrier. I would call it, it's not a barrier. It's that you're soldering. The solder penetrates a little bit to the metal, but that layer on there, it's penetrating to that layer. You've got basically a layer of dissimilar metal on your metal, right? Right. And so you're soldering to that dissimilar metal. And that that's the problem. And that makes a lot of sense with um, brass, but what about nickel? Nickel is an alloy and it's got, it's mostly copper and it's the same thing. So when you do nickel, okay. a lot of times you can get a copper layer on it or you get other things. You, you do need to sand it down and make sure that you're down to base metal. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. I have a question. Yes, um, Lori. So I often find that I'm, I, I only work in fine silver and I have a bezel and I put it on the sheet. And when it solders, there's a ring of solder on the outside. Does that mean I'm having too much solder? Or is there always, you, you can see that it shines on the outside? Well, 
so so you've got a bezel and you're soldering it to a sheet of metal, right? Right. So there's always going to be a tiny fillet of, of solder that is around the bottom of the bezel. I mean, it has to it has to adhere, right? So by having, you can minimize that. You can make that as small as possible by making sure that the fit is absolutely perfect so that your bezel, your sheet is absolutely flat and your bezel is absolutely flat and your bezel is sanded off on the bottom so that it has the, it's the widest it can be and that you're using a thicker bezel and that you don't use too much solder. Is this enough list for you? <laughs> so if you do all of those things, you're, out the, the, what you see on the outside will be minimal. The other thing is if you use hard solder, that's going to really minimize the color difference that you've got going on in the, with the fine silver and fine silver. Um, I would question why you're using fine silver as a base. Because um, I stamped it. Sorry? I'm stamping. So? It's, it's, it's just much easier. No? No. Sterling is okay. No. And it'll wear a lot better if you use sterling. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. but, um, but as far as minimizing the solder, the, the visual of the solder, use less solder. Make sure the fit is absolutely perfect. Use a wider bezel and sand the bottom of the bezel before you put it on there so that you have, there's more of an area of attachment and the solder with capillary action can fill that rather than making a fillet on the bottom of the bezel. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, we're going to start the slideshow. So this is, this is a piece that I did that was corrugated and it's just a part. It, I've never finished it, but it was how to frame corrugation. So most of you know, when we do corrugation, especially cross corrugation, we use really thin metal. We use 28 or 30 gauge even. And the problem with that is dealing with the edges. The edges are a problem. Uh, they're too thin for a lot of jewelry. They're uh, fragile. And so I've been coming up with ways to frame that, to make that something more substantial that I can work with. So what I want you to notice on this one is that over here and over here, the corrugation doesn't touch the frame and not even over here. It only touches right down here on the bottom and one little tip right there at the top. And the next slide. Oh. I just took the same piece and I held it up to the window. And the reason I did that is because I wanted you to see where it does not touch. It does not touch here and it doesn't touch all the way over here. So what I did with this, I'm gonna go back to the other slide. What I did was to pre-flow solder down here on the bigger piece, on the wire, on this uh, low dome wire. And then I fitted the, the corrugation to it. And so I could see ahead of time where the corrugation touched. I could see that it touched over here and only right here. So I could pre-flow, and Carla, this might be a place where I would use a tiny, tiny dot because I would want it just right there. So I would pre-flow a tiny, tiny piece of solder right there and I pre-flowed solder down here. And then when I heated, I would heat primarily from over here, heating to this piece. And from out here, heating to this area. And I would watch for that solder to flow. And the reason I would do it that way is because if I flow solder onto, well, number one, I can't flow it onto a 28 gauge edge. That just isn't gonna work. But even if I tried to flow it onto the corrugation, corrugation has a real problem because it's got all of these cracks and crevices and folds where solder wants to flow into it. And if it does flow into it, I cannot clean it up. There is no way of getting in there. I would have to copper plate it and hope that it wasn't real visible and just go from there. So if I can pre-flow a minimal amount of solder onto my silver frame, then what I can do is to press the piece in there, flux real well, and then heat until I just see that solder flow. This is a ring and it is soldered right here. 
Now I would never put the solder on the outside here because if I put the solder on the outside, I've got to come in here and try to clean that up. I've got a hammer texture that I couldn't get back in here and fix. Um, it would be a nightmare to try to deal with. But what I can do is to deal with the inside. So the inside is clean. The hammer texture is on the outside. The inside is not textured, it's just smooth. So if I put a piece of solder right there and then I heat primarily over here, a little bit here, but mostly here, that solder is gonna suck into there and it'll be fine. The other possibility is to pre-flow a little bit of solder right on that tip, right there and then fit the pieces and then go for the heat and watch and make sure that I've got enough solder that I see a line there. Deb? Yeah. You're saying pre-flow, but previously you've told me slump the solder rather than fully flowing it. Is there a difference? Um, no, not really. Uh, the, the difference is probably temperature. So what I mean when I say pre-flow, Slumping is probably a better word for it. Just be, well, it's kind of halfway in between, Susan. It's a really good question. So when I slump solder, you'll, you'll notice when you heat solder a lot of times, what happens is that the solder, it gets up to temperature and then it kind of slumps and it sits there for a minute and then it flows, flows, right? So most of the time we, when we're doing this pre-flowing stuff, we don't want it to flow all the way, although that's not universally true, but a lot of times that's true. The problem with slumping on something like this is that if I use the slumped solder and I put them together, they don't touch then when the solder flows. So what I have to do is to get in there with a pair of tweezers or something and squeeze them together once the solder flows. So it's a little tricky. I can, I can pre-flow the solder what I would do on this one, and I'm going to show this even more later, what I would do on this one is I would put the ring together the way I want it. I would take a scribe and I would scribe a really deep line right there. Okay, right across this piece, right there. And then when I pre-flow that solder, unless I use way too much solder, the solder is not likely to go over that line. A uh, scribed line is a great way to contain solder. So I can pre-flow the solder there. I can make it be relatively little amount of solder. I can put the ring together so that it has tension on it, so that it's pulling together really tight. And then when I heat, the solder will flow and, and it'll just go together. Thank you. You're welcome. This is another ring. So this one is, a, this is one of the thumbprint rings. This is concave right here. And you can see this is from the back of it. So you can see that the back is textured. And if I get solder on the back of that, there is no chance of me cleaning that up and making it look decent. It's always gonna look like a mess. So what I'm going to do is to pre-flow the solder. In this case, I would probably pre-flow it onto this band, but I also could choose to pre-flow it onto this part. Um, and I'll show you that later in the slides. But what I would probably do is pre-flow it onto the band and just a small amount of solder, I would touch it down. And then I would heat primarily this area, although some up the band also, until I see solder flow right there. This is another one. This was a large, really large bezel. But look at the back of it. Again, I cannot clean this up, right? If I make a mess with this, I have a mess. So what I want to do is to pre-flow the solder onto the band. I can be a little bit more generous with this because the back is so heavily textured that it can take a little bit more solder than a clean sheet could. But uh, I still need to be careful about how much I use because I do not want the solder seeping into other areas. And then when I heat, I'm gonna heat primarily the bezel. I'm going to be watching underneath to see that the, the solder does flow. And once it flows, I'm, I'm good. This is another one, and this one is a little bit different. This is one of those series. This one is just this soldered on, and again, I cannot clean this up, okay? So what I would do is to flow my solder on the end of this post prior to setting this up. I would set it up, and then I would heat primarily the bezel until I see that solder flow. This is an interesting piece. So these are three pieces I had left over from something else I was making. And um, 
what I, I, I soldered them together because I really loved the way they interacted. I thought they were really beautiful. And um, then I decided they were going to be a ring. Well, they only touch in a couple places, this ring. They only touch like right here, not the whole way. They touch right here and it touches way over here. And that is it. So on this one, you can see right here, just a little bit of solder. So what I would do on one like this is that I would pre-flow the solder underneath the copper right here, just a little, little bit of solder. And I would solder this side down. Then what I would do is to lift up this copper. I would lift the copper up and I would see where it touches the ring. Well, first of all, I'd look and see where it touches the ring here on the other side. And then I would lift it up. I would pre-flow a little bit of solder there and push it back down and then heat it up. So I'm doing this in two separate stages so that I can see exactly where it touches. And that is often, back to the first one, how I do the corrugation, is that I will take whatever is the most secure or the most, um, the firmest point where it touches, and I will put a little bit of solder there and solder it, and then I will move the corrugation out of the way because I can see exactly where it touches on the rest of it. So this one shows it again. There's a solder across here, and there's solder actually down in here. But that's it. There's no solder here, and there's no solder on the rest of this. It just is tacked right here and right here, and that's all. Yeah, would you heat the ring part or the copper to solder it? I would heat the ring, and for two reasons. I would put, that's a good question, Kathy. I would put this copper stuff, I, so I don't want to reflow my copper, right? I don't want that to change. So what I would do is to try to bury it a little bit down in the fire brick, and I would put it copper side down. I might even put a piece of brass over the two ends so that they don't come undone. They don't, they don't get heated up as much. Uh, you would use the brass as a heat sink. And then I would heat the interior of the ring with maybe just slopping over a little bit on the copper, but mostly the interior of the ring until I see that solder flow. So this is a piece I'm, I have not made yet, and it's in process. The uh, wire, the silver wire that you see there is uh, not finished at all. It's just, I just, I curved it, but it's completely unfinished. And this is a piece of gold that's been heat textured. And you can see right now, this doesn't even sit well. I think it was just clipped off with clippers. So the first thing I did was to pull this up and I filed this way flat so that it's looking you know, perfectly flat and it will sit on here better. What I would do is to pre-flow the solder right here on the end of this. And the advantage that buys me again is that if the solder slips down or slips to the inside or slips somewhere else, I can clean that up while this is a separate wire. I don't have to worry about trying to clean that up once I put this on an earring, right? So now you can see this seats much better. Look how that seats. And because of the shape of this wire, just the weight of it itself is gonna hold itself down. So if I pre-flow solder on the end of that wire and then I set it up exactly like this, and then I put most of my heat, now gold heats very differently than silver. Silver is a good conductor. So on this one, I'm actually gonna have to heat up here a little bit and then right in here. I don't need to heat gold around here. I just need to heat here and up in here. And I will see that solder flow and then I'll be good to go. There's another view of it. This is a ring, a well, potential ring. This isn't a ring yet, but it's a potential ring that I did for the scoring and bending class way back when. And I did the scoring and bending, but I never soldered it. This one has kind of a big gap in it. And, um, but that's how it fits my finger. So I'm, I may leave a big gap there, we'll see. But what I wanna point out to you is that I would not put the solder on the inside right here. And I would not put the solder on the inside right here. Where I would put the solder is way up here. And I don't want it over here where it's not the joint, but I want it way up here and way over here. And the reason I want that is because I can clean off those areas. So one of the things that you need to think about when you're doing solder placement is how am I gonna to get to this when it doesn't go where I want it to go? So if I put the solder in here and it goes all up and down the inside of this, that is a booger to get to. And I spend a lot of time getting to that inside something, right? But if it's here on the outside, that is much easier for me to deal with and get to. 
So I need to think about where I'm putting that. Here's a better view of it. If this is too big, by the way, one of the things I can do is uh, to close it down a little bit more, solder it shut, and then open it back up after it's soldered. Because silver, silvers, I can stretch that. I can bend it a little bit. So as long as I don't do this joint, I can fake it with this joint. And how would you place your torch if you put the solder on top? Where would you heat from? From the Equally. other side? Equally. Silver is such a good heat conductor. It doesn't matter if I heat on the inside or the outside or the whatever. I heat equally on both sides of the joint. So I would heat over here and over here to do this one. I would heat over here and over here to do this one, either side of the joint. So Deb, you would put this on the outside and then you would just draw it in? Not on the outside so much, right here on this corner. If it's on the outside over here, Diane, I'm not in the solder joint, right? Because this is a scoring and bending, so the joint only goes to the middle, uh, well, a little past. Just that, just that little corner. Right and there. In. Yeah, and right there. And capillary action will take over. Remember, that's the second thing. Heat is one, capillary action is two. So as long as I can use the appropriate amount of solder, capillary action is gonna suck that right into that joint. So this is a heat textured ring. And for heat textured rings, when I make them, I wanna be sure they're soldered in two places. I wanna be sure this end is tacked down and I wanna be sure this end is tacked down. I don't want either end to be where they can kind of flop around. So what I'm gonna do with this is that I would look at this very carefully to see where it's uh, attached, where, where it touches, where these two touch. And where these two touch is where I'm going to place my solder. So there's a roll right here and there's a roll right here. And I, I think I have another slide of this, but if I look at these two, I think it only touches right in here and right in here. Now, because this piece is not gonna be very visible from anywhere else except this part that hangs over, I could also scribe a line on the inside here and just flow my solder here to here, right? And then wherever it touches, it touches. Let me go on with the slides. Yes, you can see this a little bit better. So on this one, this is, this is where that front part came over. I really only want my solder, it's gonna be on this piece on the outside. It's gonna be here and it's gonna be way over in here on that outside piece. This one, I'm gonna, I, I don't want it solder over in here or over in here. I want solder right in here on that top side. So I'm gonna watch where I want it, flow the appropriate amount there. Now you can see it a little bit better again. So right here, I want it. I want some right here and I want some on the inside right there. So I'm gonna pre-flow that. And then what I would do is I usually use self-locking tweezers right here to clamp it together, to hold it together. And um, then if I hold it together and I flux it real well and I heat it, I can usually watch that solder flow. This is the next one I'm going to show you. So this is a dome right here. This is a, a dome of metal domed out and I'm gonna put it on top of this ring. So this is a big thick um, band. And what I did is to just take a very small area and file it flat right here. And you don't have to do that at all. Sometimes it makes it easier to contain the solder if you've got a little bit of a flat area or a little bit of area that's different. I can kind of see where I want the solder to be. And the solder is not as likely to jump that little, little ledge. Um, not that it can't, it certainly will, but, but it's not as likely to. So, I wanted to show you this slide. See how slight that, that is? When I solder this onto this ring, that's not even gonna be visible that I flattened it at all. It's gonna be pretty much invisible. One thing I do want to show you is see how this ring right now, I have sanded the side of it, but I have not finished it. I should not solder this band on until that is completely finished and polished and done. And the same with the inside. This is not a finished piece. I did this as a fast sample to show you uh, a solder setup, but that's it. It, there's, it. it is by no means ready to solder at this point. This is a third hand. 
Most of you have third hand, some variation of this in your studio. I have a love-hate relationship with my third hand. Um, I, they, they're great for some things and they cause a lot of problems for other things. So this is a, an actual, and this is a little bit um, blurry and I apologize. Uh, I ran out of time shooting slides, but this is, I set this up in the third hand just the way it ought to be set up for a solder joint. And it looks absolutely perfect and everything is great. Until you look at the side, I want you to look at this. Look, it's not touching. And that is one of the big problems with third hands is that it is really easy to think that you have something touching and there's a little bit of spring back and it doesn't touch. Here's a better slide of it. So when I got my camera down really low and this was exactly the same setup, I didn't change anything. All I did was to set it up. I looked at it from the top and then I looked at it from the side. And when I looked at it from the side, it was not touching. Furthermore, on this one, you can see, see the flat? The flat is also not where I thought it was. It's not flat against the dome. It's a little off. So that's one of the problems I have with third hands is that it, sometimes it's really difficult to tell if something is touching. And remember, capillary action is important. If I have solder pre-flowed on this piece and then I'm going to heat this up, there's no way it's flowing on that one. It's not touching it. So a better answer is, this is one variation of it, but it's a tripod. So it's, it's basically something with two legs here and a leg there. Let me show you. This is another tripod. This is one that I built out of nails. Uh, these are the big, um, I forget what kind of nails they're called, but the great big nails. And I only used them because they were the first ones I found in my studio. You can use any nails. I recommend something three to four inches long. I recommend, and you do not use galvanized nails. You want um, just plain old mild steel, plain old nails. And pretty hefty, pretty big nails. Um, and then I just use hard jeweler's silver solder. Lots of flux, hard solder, solder those boogers together. That is the crappiest solder joint I have done in decades. Uh, but I tried to break it apart and I couldn't, so it was good enough. This is a third one that I made for those of you who don't have a torch big enough to do the solder joint on nails. And what I did was to take a piece of steel and I just bent it and then where the legs overlap, I just took copper wire and bound it together. So next I'm gonna show you how I use the tripod. This is the end of the tripod holding that ring down. So what I did is that I can see exactly where that flat is. I can put that ring down the way I want it and then just by resting the end of this on there, I think I have another one, uh, no, maybe, in a bit. By resting this on here, it pushes down on that. This way, even if, like Susan asked earlier about slumping the solder, so even if the solder is slumped on there and it's kind of big, then when the solder flows, it'll push everything down. This is a variation of that using a um, self-locking tweezers. This is a little tripod. You can actually use ones that, um, I think you can get them for kilns, for enameling and stuff. And if you rest your tweezers on there, they pivot. And so when you put something in there, as long as this weighs more than the tail end, then it puts pressure on that and it'll stay down. You don't need the notches in the tweezers. You can just rest them on there. It works just fine. So this is the three nails one that I did. This is one of the nails. On the nails, uh, I took each end and I made them a little bit different. So this end is flat on the end. And then I did one that was rounded and one that was pointed. And this is if I wanna solder a bezel on and it seems to be creeping around and doing its own thing and going wherever it wants, which sometimes they do, I can hold this down. And this is just resting that tripod, resting one leg of that tripod on that bezel. So it's not putting a lot of weight on it because we don't wanna put a lot of weight on it because what we would do is to crush um, the item. And that, that's not beneficial. We don't wanna crush anything. So I just want a little bit of weight to hold it in place so it doesn't float around on the flux and it doesn't 
you know, if I, if I, if my solder floats away and I try to, to tack it back on, then I move it, this will hold it down. This is another one. So this is again, a leg of the uh, three nails, but I wanted to show you this because if I wanna solder this disc on at this kind of an angle, the only way I can do that to hold that at that kind of an angle easily is something like this. So I have one leg of the tripod resting on this. This disc is up in the air, see that? And that would be very hard for me to prop up or to figure out how to make that stay there any other way. There you can see it better. Now you can see my tripod. So these two legs are on the ground uh, or on your solder table. This leg goes inside this disc to hold it up at that angle. So Deb, when, yeah. you, do a, when you do a joint like that, how do you know if the solder is flowed? So sometimes they're blind. Sometimes you just have to go by color temperature of the metal. Sometimes if, um, if you did just slump it, you'll see it sit down. But if it's got more than a slump on it, if it's got a lot of, of um, you know, if the solder is thin, you won't necessarily see it sit down. And so you have to go by color of the metal. You have to, um, you have to just, just it's kind of by sense and it's, it's, it takes some practice to get good at that. So you may think it's done and take it and uh, throw it in the pickle and it comes apart and you need to do it again. Uh, but doing it several times, you'll figure it out. You'll figure out what it looks like and what the, the sheet, the metal looks like when it gets up to temperature. And it is hard when they're blind like that. It is hard when you can't see what's going on. This is a little bit better set up. You can see the tripod set up. This is a piece of wire that I, I just did because this is one, say I only wanted the wire tacked here. See how this is up in the air and this leg is up in the air. I only want it tacked right there. And that's a way I can do it. I can pre-flow my solder on my wire and again, clean up the wire if it goes where I don't want it. And then what I can do is to put it in place, flux it only right here and heat again when i heat i'm going to heat way over in here on the sheet okay and then when it's ready the solder will flow and i'm good to go so on this one this is a part but let's say that let's we'll, we'll pretend this is together but when i don't have weight on this what 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 happens is that this tends to roll back i think i have a picture yeah see the space right here I don't want that space. I, I wanted it soldered down here. I don't want it soldered up here and I don't want a space there. So when I put this weight on here, it pulls it down right here. So that if I pre-flow the solder on the back of this piece, then right here is where it's gonna solder. This is just using the other one, the one with the loop on it. So you don't need a lot of weight on these and we don't want a lot of weight. A lot of weight will, will make it crush and that's not gonna work. So this is a ring. I've shown you guys this ring before and these are not as good as shots of it. But what I want you to look at is where this piece crosses over the band here. Where that crosses over, there is not a good place for me to put solder. If I put solder in here, then I have to try to get that out. If I put solder in here, I have to try to get it out. This, uh, the underneath part, is a really clean, slick band. I do not want to have to file on that or clean it up. Um, I don't want to have to clean up the sides of this. I don't want to clean up any of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to position this where I want it. I'm going to make two scribe marks on the underside, underneath. I'm going to show you right here. I'll scribe right here and I'll scribe right here on this little part, this part across here. So a really deep scribe mark there, really deep scribe mark there. And then what I will do is to flow solder in that section only. So I would flow solder right in here on the underside. If it spills over, I can clean it up. I can make it nice and pretty. Deb, why do you not use no flow or something like, or white out? It's easier to do this. It's easier and faster and I don't have to clean it up. Um, so, Yellow ochre and white out and all of those kinds of things, if you get them overheated, you can actually make solder flow on top of them. You can make a real mess. Um, 
if so here looking at this one what i would have to do is i would have to paint exactly where that line is out and exactly where that line is over to get to, to have the solder not flow where i don't want it to flow right so what I would have to do is backwards of what I said. I would have to scribe a line into the bottom plate and scribe a line into the bottom plate and then yellow ochre or white out the rest of this and then reposition this. And then what? I'd put my solder on the side and then it would flow up the side of this and then I'd still have to clean it up? No, no. What I wanna do is to flow my solder on this little piece. And then my solder is exactly where I want it. Oops, okay, so I'm gonna flow, let's go back here. So what I'm going to do, I scribed a line underneath here. I scribed a line underneath here. I'm going to flow my solder underneath this one. If, it, if I flow too much solder on there and it gets on the sides, I can clean it up. But if I flow too much and I think it's going to be too big a mess, I can also just file off some of the solder. So I have a minimal amount of solder. Then I'll reposition this. I'll flux it really well and I'll reheat and it'll flow. And that's the end of that. And it's beautiful. It's much easier and faster. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna show you is I took a bezel. This is a bezel cup, uh, which I don't usually use, but we're gonna pretend that I'm gonna use it this time. So this is a bezel. And what I wanna do, one of the questions I had this week was soldering a, a large bezel onto a bracelet. And you don't wanna solder, I didn't wanna flow the solder onto the bracelet, um, although I could have. I don't want to solder, I don't want to just put the solder on the back of the bezel because the bezel's bigger than the bracelet and it would go all over the place and it would make a mess. So what I choose to do is to, I'm going to do a scribed area that I'm going to make the solder stay in the scribed area. But because it's a bezel, it's, it's relatively thin back and it's a large bezel. If I just put this down on my bench and I scribe a line in the back of it, I'm going to cave the bezel in and the back of the bezel. And I don't want to do that. So this is a, a, just a scrap metal post. It's a steel rod that I had left over from something. And I'm just putting that under my bezel so that when I do the next part, I won't cave my bezel in. It's something to think about. So this underneath here, this part is the silver that I'm gonna use as the bracelet. And this, is, this purple thing is a template. And so I'm looking for a square that's about the right size of my bracelet. You don't have to have a template. If you don't have a template, it's fine. You can just scribe by hand. You don't, it doesn't have to be that accurate. It has to be close. I happen to have a template. It was handy. I grabbed it. That's what I used. So then what I did is this is looking down on it. And what I did is while it was on, while the bezel was on the post, I scribed a square really deep. I want a really deep square there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-flow solder inside this square. That scribed line will help the solder stay exactly where I want it to be. And unless I get way too much solder, it won't flow over that line. It'll tend to stay right in there. So now what I have is this scribed line. This is my bracelet part. When I flow the solder on here, then I can put the bracelet on. Now, this one isn't bent yet. This is just trying it out. But um, I can bend it. I'll put it on in place. And then it will um, solder just in that area. This is another one that I want to show you. So it's using the same um, kind of idea in the same square. But this is a piece of corrugation. Now, I told you that usually what we do is to flow solder on the back of the smaller piece. I don't want to do that with corrugation because if I do that with corrugation, the likelihood of the solder going around and getting into the cracks and crevices on the front, it's just excellent. And that's going to be a mess that I cannot clean up. It's just going to be awful. So what I want to do instead is I'm going to use this square. I'm going to flow my solder in here. Then what I'm going to do, because the corrugation is so thin, I'm going to use my forming pliers. I'm going to make sure that the corners especially, but uh, also the edges are tucked down so that they're going to be touching the metal here. So I'm gonna make sure all of those are touch, touching, they're tucked down. I'm going to pre-flow solder in here. 
And then I'm going to use the tripod leg to hold this down while I heat. The tripod leg does a couple of things for me. It holds it in place, which in the middle of a sheet like that can often be really difficult. You know, it can float around and turn and do its own thing. The other thing that it does is because it's the steel and I'm holding it in the middle of it, and because I filed this at an angle here and it has good contact, it's gonna help act as a heat sink so that when I heat out around it, it's gonna equalize the heat between the little piece and the big piece or help equalize. This is the last one I'm gonna show you. This is a part for a brooch that I did a long time ago. But the corrugated, or the corrugated, the uh, roller printed piece here, I don't wanna get solder on that, but I wanna put this edge on it. So number one is I need to make sure it fits really well. And then I'm using cotter pins to hold it in place. But the trick to making this work is, look, there's a ledge out here. Can you see that all the way along, there's a ledge that sticks out? That ledge all the way along is going to get cut off um, or filed off. So what I'm going to do when I put my solder here is I'm going to put my solder out here or I'm going to put it underneath this wire, underneath meaning that I pre-flow it onto the wire. In this situation, I don't believe I put it under the wire, but I could have. I could have pre-flowed it on the wire. What I did in this one was to put it on the outside here. And then when it flows, and I could heat mostly over the large piece, heat over in here. And when I see that it flows the entire distance and I'm happy with it, then what I can do is to file this ledge off and then I'm good to go. And then I don't have to clean up the other side because I didn't make a mess on the other side. I believe, yep, that's the last slide. So that is telling you how to not to make a mess and how to do some better soldering. Do I have questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, yes, Lori. So I, have these i guess it's a fire block and um also the white boards and when i solder my bezels often they attach to the board and so when i lift the bezel what do you do about that so what's making it attached to the board or to the brick is the flux and the flux is really gummy um when it's not and and actually once it, it gets to room temperature it's hard uh, but even when it's warm, it's really gummy. And when it's only really liquidy when it's hot, hot, hot. So what you have to do is um, that you have to heat the piece up again just to the, till the flux gets, gets uh, liquidy, okay? And that's well below solder temperature. So either you can, there's a couple ways to do it. When you're soldering a bezel shut, the one thing you can do is that as soon as that solder solidifies, you can go in there and pick it up, okay? Because the flux is still, is still liquidy at that point. The other thing you can do is let it solidify and uh, then go back in with a torch and heat it up very gently. Now I know with a bezel, you, want, it's very, you, you don't have a lot of metal there and you can't dump a lot of heat into it. So what you wanna do is just heat a little, little bit and, and you can be pulling on it and the flux will give up and then it'll lift off. Um, you can also use a cleaner fire brick or whatnot. You can clean fire bricks by rubbing them together over a trash can. You wanna wear a dust mask because you don't wanna breathe that. Um, the whiteboards are the, 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 those you can't clean so easily. Um, and I, you know, they just do get flux on them. So when, when you go to pick it up, don't just pick it up. Uh, heat it up a little bit and then pick it up and then it'll it'll lift up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Somebody hey, else had a question. Dad? Yeah. Dad? Mm -hmm. Me? Yeah, Wendy. Oh, I just thought I would throw the tip in that I saw from Metal Smith Society for a third hand or for a, like a tripod was the metal binder clips onto self-locking tweezers on the end. And oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Amazing, cheap, available. You don't have to solder anything together and it really works well. That's a great idea. Yeah, just the, um, like these guys. Yep, and they come in all sizes. 
Yeah, you don't want to get this one because it's plastic coated, but right. get one that's not plastic coated. Really, really worked well. Yeah, and put that on the end of the tweezers. The other thing is a magnet on the end of the self-locking tweezers also works really well and uh, lets the tweezers kind of float a little so that it holds it down. That works really well. Yep. Yeah. Deb? Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. Deb, when you, when you had that ring that had the check mark on it and you did the scribed lines, so mm -hmm. when, the, when the one piece came up over the top, underneath you, you scribed uh, a line on the top and on the bottom, and then you filled underneath that section? Yeah. Okay, and so, and so you scribed the line so that the solder didn't go past the scribed line, right? Partly it doesn't go past, but partly I also know where to flow, flow the solder. Because, you know, when you have a piece together and you see how you want it, and then you open it back up, you're going, hmm, where was that? How did that fit on there, you know? Mm -hmm. So it gives me um, a visual indicator as well as giving me a physical barrier for the solder not to cross. Okay. It does both. Any other questions? I have a quick one. Yes, Susan. Your color pins are always real shiny and new in all your pictures. Do you <laughs> use fresh ones every time or is it okay no. to use old cruddy ones? No, I use stainless steel cotter pins and they hold up really, really well. And I reuse them and reuse them and reuse them and reuse them until they just are dead. If you use the not stainless ones, the problem with them is they're often galvanized, which is really wicked. They're, they're zinc coated and, and you don't want to burn that off. That's really bad for you. Um, but the other thing is that you use them once and then they're annealed and then they don't hold and then they're just junk. Um, so I use the stainless ones. They're a little bit more expensive to buy, but man, they hold up really well. I have a question. Yes, Patty. Is a scribe? I don't have a scribe. I don't have that. Tool. Oh, you do. You've got to have a scribe. What is a scribe? What does it look like? Hang on. I'll show you a scribe. I am looking everywhere. Okay. This is one scribe. Okay. This is a, a carbon scribe. This is, let me find more. I've got tons of scribes. This is a scribe. It's a little pointy tool. Scribes are little pointy tools. I don't have one. <gasps> I can't believe it. Of all the things here, I don't have one. Okay, Patty. Okay. Next time you stop by. Okay. <laughs> next time you stop by, I've got scribes. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there's all kinds of scribes. There's, um, you know, I, I have the twisted ones. I don't have one right here. I don't see. I don't see one. So, um, but there's all kinds of different scribes that you can get and have, and uh, you just need something that'll that'll make a mark into uh -huh. metal. All right. All right. Can you not also just like sharpen a nail and use that in a pinch? You in a pinch, yeah. It'll dull in no time at all. I mean, a nice scribe is is great and worth it, but in a pinch, absolutely, yeah, it'll work. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. I want to thank you for joining me today for this edition of Studio Time with Deb online, and I hope to see you next week. Bye.